The Colosseum in Rome has been standing for almost 2,000 years. The world's largest unreinforced concrete dome, the Pantheon, also in Rome, was built in 128 AD. So if Western Roman structures can look like this after two millennia, why does modern construction so often look like this after only a few decades? Roman concrete is one of the most resilient construction materials ever created. It was even capable of setting and hardening underwater, an essential property as it allowed the Romans to build structures such as harbors, breakwaters, and piers out into the sea. It has even been shown to have the ability to self-heal small cracks that appear in the material. The secrets for how the Romans produced this construction material have been lost for over a millennium, but announced last week, a team of investigators from MIT, Harvard University, and laboratories across Italy and Switzerland have finally uncovered the secret to this ancient concrete manufacturing process. Today, we're looking at why Roman concrete never crumbles. The history of decoding Roman concrete is absolutely fascinating. We found countless accounts of very strict specifications for the raw materials detailed by ancient scholars like Vitruvius. Vitruvius was a Roman architect and engineer during the first century BC. His discussion of perfect proportions in architecture as well as in the human body led to the famous Renaissance drawing of the Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci setting the original, unachievable body standard. Accounts of these strict specifications for concrete described the ingredients as water, limestone, volcanic ash, and rock fragments, including where they should be sourced from and the level of quality that they should be mined. Limestone in particular had to be pure white, so as to lack any impurities. Many of our recent scientific approaches to decoding the capabilities of Roman concrete fixated on certain ingredients of that mixture, specifically the volcanic ash, which accounts specified should be sourced from the area around the Bay of Naples. Accounts by architects and historians at the time document this specific kind of ash was shipped across the vast Roman Empire to be used in construction and was described as a key ingredient for concrete. In a previous study published in 2017 out of the University of Utah, researchers focused on concrete structures submerged in the ocean that once made up Roman piers and breakwaters. These structures were famously described by Pliny the Elder, a Roman natural philosopher and military commander, as impregnable to the waves and every day growing stronger. And he was right, the material grew more physically resilient every year that it remained in the ocean, the opposite to modern concrete. An analysis of samples taken from these concrete piers revealed deposits of a mineral called aluminous toberamide. A rare substance that's incredibly difficult to produce and probably wouldn't have been present in the concrete when it was first set. After exploration, the research team found that as small cracks formed within the concrete, seawater seeped into the material and began to produce a low temperature reaction between the salt water and the volcanic ash crystals. This produced crystals of aluminous toberamide and repaired and actually increased the strength of the material. This discovery well explained the strength of marine concrete, but how had structures on land survived so well also? And what was the recipe for this concrete mixture? as modern approaches to replicate it have always failed. Under closer examination of samples of ancient concrete collected across the Roman Empire, practically every sample also contained these small, bright white mineral features about the size of a millimeter. These white clusters originate from the limestone used in manufacture and are usually referred to as lime clasts. These inclusions were previously disregarded by researchers as mistakes during ingredient preparation or poor or incomplete mixing of the material before use. But if the Romans put so much effort and understanding into documenting, sourcing, and optimizing the right ingredients at the right quality levels, why would they have such low quality control in the final mixing and preparation of their materials? It makes no damn sense. It compels me though. Limestone harvested from quarries is burned to produce something called quicklime, a material used commonly today in plaster and cement production, steel making, paper, 
It even emits light when heated above 2400 degrees centigrade and used to be used in theatrical productions before the invention of electric lighting, giving rise to the term in the limelight. Historically, it had been assumed that when lime was incorporated into Roman concrete, it was first combined with water in a process known as slaking. This process produces a highly reactive paste-like material as well as a lot of thermal energy. But the MIT research team led by Admir Masik suggested that this process alone probably couldn't account for the presence of lime class. Through their research by making spectroscopic examinations of the clusters, the research team observed a hydration gradient of the outer hydrated core and inner unhydrated core of calcium oxide suggesting that they had likely formed under extreme temperatures. This would have been unlikely if the material had first been fully hydrated through slaking. Instead, the researchers believed that quicklime had been directly added into the concrete mixture in a process called hot mixing. Hydration of quicklime produces an exothermic reaction as calcium oxide hydrates to form calcium hydroxide. The temperature increase in the mortar could be as much as 55 to 60 degrees centigrade over ambient conditions, with the presence of hotspots exceeding over 200 degrees centigrade. The benefits of hot mixing would also be that this increased temperature significantly reduces curing and setting time since all the reactions are accelerated, allowing for a much faster construction process. During the hot mixing process, the lime class develop a characteristically brittle nanoparticle structure, creating an easily fractured and reactive calcium store within the concrete structure. As a concrete construction slowly aged and tiny cracks started to form within the concrete, the cracks will preferentially travel through the weaker high surface area lime class. As rainwater then later permeated those cracks, this material could react with water, creating a calcium saturated solution, which can recrystallize into calcium carbonate and quickly fill those cracks or react with volcanic ash components, further strengthening and healing the material. Well, can they prove it? To prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this indeed was the mechanism responsible for the durability of Roman concrete, the team set out to run an experiment. They produced samples of hot mixed concrete that incorporated both ancient as well as modern ingredients, as well as a set of controls that did not include quicklime. The team observed that the hot mixed concrete contained small white lime clasts throughout the form. But in the slaked mixture without quicklime, these clasts were absent, compelling evidence that this was in fact how Romans made their concrete. As a final test, the researchers split each concrete column down the middle and remated them together about a millimeter apart. They then set up a pump system to continually flow water through the gap between each side of the concrete. Would it also have those elusive self-healing properties? Amazingly, just a few weeks in, the team had noticed that the system had automatically shut itself off. Water had ceased to flow through the hot mixed concrete sample. The control samples without the quick lime were left to run, but never repaired themselves. The team made a final spectroscopic measurement of the sample to determine its composition. They found a calcium carbonate material, indicating the crack had been healed by these small, previously dismissed lime clasts. Wait, did we? Did we do it? We did it! Anyone can make a bridge that stands. Only an engineer can make a bridge that barely stands. Optimizing construction materials for builds that have been designed to use the minimum materials, the minimum cost, but while also getting the job done is really hard. At the moment, the concrete production industry is a significant contributor to climate change as the production of cement, a key ingredient in concrete, is responsible for about 8% of global CO2 emissions. By improving our understanding of self-healing concretes, the improved durability and lifespan of concrete structures 
can reduce the need for repairs and production of new concrete to replace damaged structures. This can also reduce the overall demand for concrete and the associated CO2 emissions from its production. The team at MIT have already begun work with industry groups to turn this breakthrough in understanding into improved materials to help reduce carbon emissions. Tackling these sorts of challenges is actually what I spend most of my time doing when I'm not on YouTube. In my day job, I run a company that helps scientists turn scientific breakthroughs into solutions to make a difference to the world and support the health of people and the planet. If you'd like to support my work or similar work on climate change, check out today's sponsor, REN. REN is a website where you can calculate your carbon footprint, then offset it by funding a diverse mix of carbon reduction projects like tree planting, mineral weathering, and rainforest protection. By answering a few questions about your life, you'll find out what your personal carbon footprint is and how to reduce it. Once you sign up, you can support projects you believe are making a difference, as well as helping to offset your own carbon footprint. You'll receive monthly updates from the projects you support, and you'll get to see where your money is being spent, with photos and details of every tree planted, every acre reforested, and every ton of carbon offset. I've partnered with REN so that the first 100 people that sign up below will get their first month of subscription covered for free by REN. Thank you again to REN for sponsoring this episode and making my work possible. And thank you for watching.